All right, uh, I'm afraid this video is going to be a little longer than I want it to be, so let me just jump in. So chapter 9 is all about emotions and the idea that our emotions play a big part in who we are and therefore have a big role in how we communicate. So the first section of chapter 9 talks about what are emotions, and there are there's probably more to it than you thought about. One of the things the textbook starts by talking about is the work of Daniel Goleman from the 1990s. He wrote a book uh, called Emotional Intelligence, and then he wrote a bunch of other books. And uh, so think about, are you emotionally intelligent? The um, main components of emotional intelligence are the ability to understand, to recognize your own emotions and to manage them. And that's the the personal part. And then there's the social part is to be sensitive to the feelings of others. And there is uh, some evidence that it's, I don't want to say less. So while your own, what we think of as IQ is important, Goleman uses the term EQ, that that is also a, has a, a huge impact on a person's success in, in the world of work and in other interpersonal um, interactions. So four components to this. I think the book does a really good job talking about what they are. The, remember, we keep going back to this term physiological, that what is happening within the body. So for example, um, you, uh, I'll use something that everyone can probably relate to. You are in an important situation and you mess up your words and all of a sudden you, uh, your heart starts beating faster. Okay. That is a physiological change. We, we don't really have an awful lot of control over that. A nonverbal behavior could be maybe you start cracking your knuckles or twirling your hair or whatever you might do when you feel a little ill at ease. A cognitive interpretation is where you actually give words to it. Oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. I'm so embarrassed. And then the verbal expression, you would say, I'm so sorry. Uh, I messed up. I'm really embarrassed. Okay. <clears throat> and we can talk about this much more in class because I think this is really interesting and important. So part two says, well, what are the things that influence? Okay, I want to I want to uh, emphasize a key word here is expression. We don't want to have the idea that. Uh, oh, how can I say this? Everybody around the world experiences emotions. It is what we, how we express them that has differences. Okay. So what are some of the, this is not going to surprise you. Um, what are some of the things that can influence how we choose <laughs> at some level to express our emotions, obviously culture. And I, I want to talk about uh, a book that I read where the woman is originally from, uh, I want to say Holland. I think she's Dutch. And she talks about emotions. Um, also gender. And when we talk about gender, remember we're also talking about culture because gender is, you know, what does the society that you live in say about how men should express emotions and how women should express emotions and what emotions is it okay for them to express? There are also social conventions. For example, it is... Uh, absolutely not okay for a first responder to get really, uh, you know, I couldn't be a first responder. If I saw a terrible accident, I would probably start crying. When people work to, to suppress, to not uh, express their emotions, that's called emotion labor. And then there is a concept called emotional contagion, which is kind of the idea that we can catch other people's emotions. And it's so interesting, this morning, uh, my son and I were going out to get apple fresh out of the grease, apple cider donuts, and I happened to turn on NPR, and there was a section on emotions and emotional expression, and I need to listen to the whole 
doohickey, and I will share it with the class on Wednesday because it sounded fascinating. Okay. So, <clears throat> Now, okay, we have an, a basic understanding of what emotions are and what things influence how we express or don't express emotions. Well, how can you make sure that you are expressing them effectively? Okay, so one thing that I want to make clear is, in, in a sense, there is no such thing as a bad emotion, although I'm not sure that rage, well, maybe it, it, has, it, it has a place. Okay, so... Uh, the first thing, and it can be hard for some people is to recognize your feelings. Then you have to choose, and it, it, it can be hard to do this in the moment. Choose the best language to use. Like you are furious with someone. Is it acceptable to say you are a slimy, contemptible sewer rat, which is a line from a Walt Disney cartoon. Okay. It is okay to share that you have multiple feelings and... <laughs> Because uh, but a lot of situations are complex and we do feel more than one thing. Your best friend says to you, I got the job of my dreams and I'm moving to California. And so you might be feeling happy because they got the job of their dreams. A little jealous because you don't have the job of your dreams. Uh, a little bit sad because they're moving far away. And, and that is absolutely normal. Okay. And then you have to recognize the difference between feeling something and acting on something. And acting on that can include saying something. Do you say, I'm so happy for you and I'm also so jealous. I want to scratch your face off. Maybe not. Okay. And just because we are feeling uh, sad doesn't mean we have to cry. And just because we are feeling angry doesn't mean we have to punch someone in the face. Okay. Um, who... We're going to talk about this next one when we get to the fallacies. Um, you have to accept responsibility for your feelings. You cannot blame others for how you feel. And most importantly, choose the best time and place to express your feelings. Okay, it, just because you're feeling something in the moment, that moment might not be the best time to share that. Okay. Uh, the textbook has the interesting idea that um, if you look, if the, the column, the, the, the uh, visual that's on the right shows five different emotion families. And we tend to look at what's in the middle. We might say we're angry and, ra and we might say, I'm a little angry or I'm very angry. And one of the things the textbook is suggesting is that we increase our vocabulary of emotion words that instead of saying well I'm a little angry why don't we say I'm annoyed and instead of saying well I'm very angry why don't we say we're furious because sometimes those qualifiers a little or very they're not heard <laughs> but the word furious that I would say the word furious is actually more powerful than very angry okay so just think about that look at this visual in in the textbook so we want to make the different, we want to differentiate the ideas of facilitative emotions and debilitative emotions. And facilitative emotions are emotions that help us function. And debilitative emotions are emotions that cause problems. So for example, um, I'll go with anger. In some situations, anger can help you, um, can function because it, it, maybe you're angry about a situation and so it, it pushes you to say something and to act to change that situation. But if you get so angry that you, you foam at the mouth and you can't say anything, then it becomes debilitative. And sometimes we get stuck in a pattern where we think and think and think about something. And that's called rumination. All right. So interesting side note, um, a cow is an animal that's called a ruminant because basically what they do is they, they, they chew their cud. They take their grasses or clover or whatever, and they chew and they chew and they chew and it goes into a stomach and then it, it doesn't disappear then. I think they, I don't remember how many stomachs they have, 
but so in a sense when we can't let go of an emotion we're like that cow chewing and chewing on it we're ruminating okay in class i want to talk a lot about the idea that thoughts cause feelings and this is based on the work of albert ellis and i'm going to show you a model but years ago uh Ellis had an ABC, and they've since it's expanded it to A, B, C, D, and E. So we have an activating event, and um, okay. So let's let me let me give you an example here. Um, I'm working at a uh, I'm, I'm helping set up a party for a friend of mine who's retiring, and somebody says to me, "Marguerite, go home." And I think my belief is, "Uh oh, I've done something wrong." And so I'm feeling hurt and embarrassed. Okay. And if I just stop there, then maybe I decide I'm not even going to go to the party because, you know, or <laughs> same thing. I'm at the party. I'm helping set up and they say, Marguerite, go home. And I think, you know, I've been here longer than anyone else and I've been working really hard. So the emotional consequences are I'm feeling respected because they see the work that I've done. Okay, but let's go with that more negative. So um, I'm feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm such a, I'm such a failure. They they don't appreciate me. So I have to I go into the D, which is to dispute. Okay, and then I say, really, these are your friends. These are your colleagues. Do you think that they really think that you are not a good worker? So I have to dispute that. And if I dispute it, what is the effect? What is the consequence? of challenging the self-defeated belief, I decide I am actually going to go to the party. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more because I think this is, this is really important, especially for some of the more challenging emotions that we can face. And I think Albert Ellis had a lot of good ideas. Okay. Uh, I would like to spend time in class talking about these seven fallacies. Um, I should have made this text smaller because it's hurting my eyes to look at it. Okay. Um, I really, I don't, I don't want to talk about this now because I know that half of you don't even um, watch these videos. So these are fallacies. These are ways of thinking that can cause debil they're irrational and they can cause debilitative emotions and so we call them fallacies <clears throat> and um, i'm hoping you're going to look at these so this would be a good um good uh entire class discussion we might do that okay and then <clears throat> knowing that these fallacies can uh, lead to debilitating emotions here are some things you can do to Minimize debilitative emotions. You have to do some, hold on one second. Ah, okay. Um, and this is a time when some self-monitoring is very good. So you something happens and you have an emotional reaction and you say to yourself, is this, it, it, I don't want to say normal. Is this reaction in line with what happened? And maybe if it's way out of whack, you might say to yourself, I'm tired, I'm hungry, uh, I'm, I'm, I, maybe I'm getting sick. Okay. Also, um, what's your figure out what your trigger is. <laughs> Definitely record. They don't mean to actually write it down, but actually pay attention to your self-talk. What are you saying to yourself? And then do some reappraisal, which is look at that Albert Ellis model and say, okay, what what happened what was my underlying belief and then do change your self-talk which let's think about chapter six let's look at language you're going to replace words like can't have to and should we're going to look at the language of choice with words like will and want to and choose to and i believe is that it is that the end 